الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد. As parents, many times we advise our youth, our children, to avoid having friends, whether they be Muslim or non-Muslim, who do drugs, deal drugs, or the like. And we tell them to fear Allah. We mention to them statements from the Quran and from the Hadith. But sometimes our kids are not there yet. Sometimes this does not have the desired effect upon them. So there's a nice benefit from Sheikh Huthaymin. They asked him if a person does not commit a sin because he's afraid of some worldly punishment, is this a type of polytheism? And he said, no. Meaning it's okay if a person does not commit a sin or a crime because they fear being punished in this world. He said because Allah Ta'ala, he prescribed the punishment in this world to be a deterrent for the sinner. And it is known that some sinners are going to be prevented from committing a sin because they fear a worldly punishment, although this person may not have any fear of Allah. Although no doubt it is better if a person avoids committing a sin because he fears Allah, because he loves Allah. But people are not always there yet. So if it takes the threat of a worldly punishment, then this is also something which is okay. So keeping this in mind, we know there are several lectures advising our youth to stay away from gangs and drugs and the like. But I like to mention some worldly reasons, some worldly reasons why you should be very careful whom you select as a friend. One reason you should keep good friends is something called guilty by association, meaning that you can be convicted of a crime just because you know someone who committed a crime. It's called a conspiracy charge. So I like how Brother Roha Bats broke this down, so I'm going to explain to you what he said. For example, if you have a friend who deals drugs and the police arrest this person, the police are going to put pressure on this person to tell them who is involved with him in the drug trade. And it's simple. If he tells who is involved with him, his prison sentence is going to be light. If he doesn't tell, he's going to prison for a long time. So what do you think he's going to do? And all he has to do is prove that he knows you, phone records, text message, etc. If he can prove that he knows you, that's all it needs. So, for example, the person who gets arrested may say, Person A is a drug dealer, while person B, meaning you, hangs out with them. But person B, meaning you, is the real drug supplier. And I receive half a key of cocaine from person B, you, every month. And so the police may say, well, how long have you been doing this? And the person will say, I have been doing this for the last two years. Now the police can come and charge you with a two year conspiracy for selling half a key of cocaine every month, even if no drugs were found on you at all. The minimum penalty for this is 10 years in prison. Maximum is life in prison. And if you go to trial and you get convicted, you're going to prison for life. Now we're going to mention to you some examples of this. So you know that this is real and there are hundreds of examples. And this is some research that was done by a woman named Jennifer Turner, who works for the ACLU. Douglas Ray Duncans Jr. was sentenced to life in prison without the chance for parole at age 26 for conspiracy to possess and distribute crack cocaine. Now at trial, they said that he had been dealing crack cocaine for two years and the conspiracy was based upon the testimony of 15 co-conspirators and no drugs were ever found in the case. So he was convicted based upon the testimony of the co-conspirators and they received reduced prison sentences for their testimony.
and Duncan's was sentenced to a mandatory life without parole. Now, if he would have been convicted for actually having powdered cocaine, he would have only stayed in prison for 20 years, but he was convicted of a conspiracy to sell crack, although no crack was ever found, and he got life in prison without parole. It was so bad that Judge Terry Means, who gave the sentence, he said, he said, it does seem unfair that the guidelines bind me to give you a life sentence. It troubles me to think that at your age, you are going to have to spend the rest of your life in prison. It troubles me a lot. This was the first felony conviction that Duncan's ever had. He had only been convicted before of one prior misdemeanor for shoplifting from Kmart when he was 21 years old. Michael Fitzgerald Wilson, a father of three and former business owner, was sentenced to LWOP, life without parole, although he was a first time nonviolent drug offender. He was convicted based upon the testimony of co-conspirators. And they say that he was convicted of a conspiracy to sell crack cocaine. Now, the way that the judge gave him life in prison is the judge looked at the testimony of the co-conspirators who, by the way, were testifying against him so they could get a shorter prison sentence. And he looked at the testimony of the police. So the co-conspirators said that Mr. Wilson was selling cocaine for two years and selling 50 grams of crack cocaine. So the judge did some math, 50 grams of crack cocaine for two years and came up with a life sentence for Mr. Wilson. And the judge also said one of the other co-conspirators, he gave him life in prison. Therefore, Mr. Wilson had to get life in prison also. Former President Bill Clinton commuted the sentence of one of the co-conspirators who happened to be the only white defendant involved in the case. Coincidence? Maybe, maybe not. And Mr. Wilson was left holding the bag and he has life in prison without the possibility of parole. Now, I'm not saying any of these people are innocent or they're guilty. My point is it didn't matter because there were no drugs found in any of these cases. It was only the testimony of the co-conspirators who were testifying so they could get a reduced sentence in their case. No drugs were found, only the testimony of the other co-conspirators. And that's all it took for these people to be given life in prison without the possibility of parole. So keep that in mind. If someone testifies against you and they can prove that they know you, then you can get life in prison without them finding any drugs on you at all. So if you have friends who are gang members or drug dealers and they get arrested by the police, don't expect anyone is going to be loyal. There's not really any loyalty in the game. Now, this also applies to our young Muslim women. Sometimes our young Muslim women may want to get involved with a, a thug, as they say, we have Sharonda Jones. She was a mother with no prior criminal record. She's serving life without parole for a crack cocaine conspiracy based almost entirely upon the testimony of co-conspirators. According to the court records, a friend of hers who was a government informant called her on the phone and asked her if she knew where she could buy drugs. According to the evidence, Mrs. Jones said that she may know someone that she could introduce them to. And that's it. Life without the possibility of parole. They also charged her with possession of a weapon, although she is a licensed firearm carrier. They charged her with that anyway. Now, the co-conspirators who testified against her, they were released from prison in 2008. But Ms. Jones remains in prison to this day, no possibility with no possibility for parole. Stephanie Yvette George, a single mother of three, is serving life without parole for drugs her former boyfriend stored in a lockbox in her attic. 
Her boyfriend, Mr. Dickey, confessed to the drugs. He had the key to the safe. He had the money. But he was released from prison five years ago while Mrs. George remains in prison. The judge, Judge Vincent, said, your role has basically been a girlfriend and a bag holder and money holder. So certainly in my judgment, it doesn't warrant a life sentence, but I really don't have any choice in the matter. See, her boyfriend was a drug dealer, storing drugs in her house. He's home and she has life in prison, the mother of three. So you have to understand there's a great incentive to place you in prison. Prison is a business. They earn over $74 billion a year through prison. And that's why they have many private prisons here in America today. And they charge the inmates for simple things. They say that a 15 minute phone call in state can cost anywhere between $1.50 to $12.50. The wages, because prisoners, they work in the prison. And the wages range from 23 cents an hour to a dollar and 15 cents per hour. And a lot of it is hard work. There's a prison here in North Carolina that I visited to go and speak with some of our brothers in the prison. And this prison is nicknamed the farm. The farm. This prison sits on 7,500 acres. Wallahi, they have cotton fields there. The prisoners are picking cotton. You're going to travel back in time. Your ancestors were picking cotton. You want to go to prison and pick cotton? Off topic, but I believe it's of benefit as we're speaking about good companionship and bad companionship. And one thing that happens from having bad companionship is our youth begin to date, have boyfriends and girlfriends. And we know that fornication is haram in Islam. It's a major sin. This is well known. But there are also some worldly harms that come from fornication, such as getting sick, getting an illness. But there's one that maybe the youth don't think about. And I have seen this happen before to people who I know personally. And this is statutory rape. The example that's given by the lawyers is each state has an age of consent. So if there is a boy who turns 16 on March the 1st, but his girlfriend turns 16 on March the 10th, the boy can be charged with statutory rape if he has sex with his girlfriend between March the 1st and March 9th because the young woman was not yet 16. And so you see how this is almost like a setup when they put the boys and girls in the same school. High school, ninth grade to 12th grade. You may have a 12th grader who's 17, 18 years old and someone in the ninth grade or the 10th grade who's 14 or 15. And they may think it's common for them to date. But if her parents file statutory rape or if she were to file a statutory rape charge, that boy is going to spend eight to 12, maybe 20 years in prison. So something else that you have to consider. These girlfriends that you want to have, if she gets upset, her parents get upset, and they file a statutory rape charge against you, you are going to prison. And when you get out, you're going to be registered as a sex offender. So if we didn't learn anything else from this COVID-19, we learned that no one likes to be confined to the home. But with the home, although we don't like to be confined to the home, we do have our telephones, the internet, the youth have the video games, etc. Imagine being confined to prison. 
So be careful, young brothers and sisters. One mistake can change your life forever. Make sure that you keep good company. People that are going to remind you of Allah and people that have the same goal to get the paradise that you all should have. May Allah Ta'ala give us and you success in this life and the next to reach that goal of paradise.